All right, it is two minutes past the hour. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. On behalf of the Kalamazoo Area Wild Ones chapter, we're excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar. I'm your host, Jason Ballou. I'm the current vice president and membership chair of the Kalamazoo chapter. Uh, for those of you who are new to Wild Ones, and we've had several uh, new members join recently, uh, we are a nonprofit uh, membership organization dedicated to promoting native plants and natural and sustainable landscaping. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, please visit our website at kalamazoowildones.org. Uh, there you'll find links to our programs and activities, our Facebook page, uh, YouTube channel uh, with recordings of previous uh, presentations and uh, tonight's as well and also a sign up for our monthly newsletter uh, seed links. So uh, as most of you know, we're a completely volunteer-based organization. So we're always looking for uh, enthusiastic uh, volunteers to get involved and help. Um, if you're interested, uh, please email us at info at kalamazoowildones.org. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Klug, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Mike. All right, so tonight's speaker is Brad Herrick. Brad's an ecologist and program manager at the University of Wisconsin's uh, Arboretum, which is in Madison. Brad holds degrees from Luther College and the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And he's currently working on his PhD at the Nelson Institute of Environmental Studies, which is also on the University of Wisconsin's Madison campus. Brad's been researching the effects of jumping worms on plant and soil interactions in forests and residential gardens since 2013. He has given many talks and interviews about jumping worms. And tonight his talk will focus on how jumping worms interact with their environment and how these interactions differ from those of other earthworms. He will also touch on how we can identify them and the steps we may make to minimize the spread and their impact. Take it away, Brad. All right, Mike, thank you very much for that nice introduction. And like Jason mentioned, um, I'm happy to take questions at the end that, that helps to kind of keep the presentation going. I have a lot of information to share with you. Um, so I'll do my best to, to stay on time here. Um, so we're gonna talk tonight about this new invasive earthworm group called, uh, collectively called uh, the jumping worms. Um, and usually when I give these talks in person, I ask, I ask the audience um, for a, a raise of hands of who has heard of jumping worms or who has um, experience with them in their yards or other, other areas. Uh, just to get a sense of the audience. It's hard to do that uh, virtually, um, but I'm guessing most of you um, being gardeners or uh, naturalists, restorationists, um, are familiar with the concept of jumping worms. Um, if not, this will be new information, um, and that's great too. Um, so I have a bit of a wide ranging talk. I'm gonna try and cover a lot of topics tonight, um, starting off with just basic earthworm biology and ecology. Um, what are earthworms? How do they interact with their environment? Um, and then we'll move into a little bit more detail about how to identify different earthworms, specifically um, jumping worms from other European earthworms <clears throat> that are, are uh, very common in our soil. And then the bulk of the talk obviously will be um, more on jumping worms themselves, um, how they arrived here, um, why they are concerning to um, scientists and land managers, uh, gardeners, a lot of folks, how they impact our gardens, how they impact plants. Um, and finally, we'll wrap up with some potential controls, what we can do um, if we do have them uh, on our site. So um, quickly here, and this will be as a few slides of introduction of what earthworms are, earthworms, uh, they feed on soil and organic matter. Um, they're relatively simple organisms. 
Um, the organic matter that, that they feed on um, can be diverse, but it's often leaf litter, um, especially in, in forests, like maple forests um, in our part of the country. Um, they are promiscuous, they are polygamous, uh, hermaphroditic, uh, but some can reproduce what we term parthenogenically, meaning that they don't need a mate to reproduce viable offspring. Um, so one adult earthworm has potentially has the ability to produce cocoons, which are um, basically the, the eggs that house new earthworm hatchlings. Um, and so that's, that's the biggest difference between jumping worms and other earthworms is that they don't necessarily need a mate to reproduce. <clears throat> but that's, that's one of the big differences in terms of the re reproduction. Um, so earthworms are generally lumped into three different functional groups. And these functional groups are defined by where the earthworms spend their time, um, whether it's just hanging out or feeding, um, whatever. It's where they, in what part of the soil they, 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 they tend to live in. And so we have these, these um, litter dwellers, the earthworms that really don't go into the soil at all. They're on top of the soil, but amongst organic matter. Those are called epigeic um, or the litter dwellers. And they're, this red box kind of highlights um, the area where you're gonna find those, um, those earthworms. And then if we go down into the soil profile um, a few inches, uh, we meet the endogeic earthworms. And these are the top soil dwellers. So they're just below the, the, the litter layer, but they're in soil. They're spending their time in soil um, and, and don't really range um, too far from, that, from the top uh, five, six inches of the soil. Um, and then of course, you guessed it, we have another group of earthworms that are the deep soil dwellers, the, the, the subsoil. These are called anisic or anikic. Um, and um, a good example of this earthworm would be the common nightcrawler that uh, most of us are familiar with, um, common fishing bait. <clears throat> um, and so um, jumping worms actually span these two horizons, the epigeic and endogeic. And so we refer to them as epi-endogeic. So they have the ability to burrow down a little bit into the topsoil, um, but most of the time under kind of normal moisture conditions, they're gonna be in that, in that um, upper litter layer. So they're very easy to find um, unless we've had drought conditions, which we had last year in Madison. Um, and so it was for a while, it was challenging to find them in the litter layer. You had to dig down to find them, um, but they're not going to be more than a few inches deep. Okay. Um, so we know a lot about uh, European earthworms. Um, and I should mention too that um, anywhere um, that, that experienced um, coverage by the last glaciation. Um, so, you know, 10,000 years ago or so um, is our areas that do not have native earthworms, native terrestrial earthworms. Um, and so a lot of the upper Midwest um, was covered by glacier. Um, and so the thinking is that if there were native earthworms uh, previous to that, um, they were wiped out from the action of the glaciers. Um, and so all, all earthworms that we have um, now are primarily before jumping worms are European species brought over several hundred years ago. Um, and they're really, they're really uh, ubiquitous, right? They're, they're in every type of soil. Um, and so there's been a lot of research on their impacts on forests, especially um, since forests, um, evolved in the absence of earthworms. And so if you look at this figure here, on, on the left-hand side, you have a healthy forest, a healthy forest floor. Um, and so you have uh, very defined soil layers. Um, you have a really nice, healthy, spongy leaf layer. That's the organic layer. That's really important to hold moisture, hold nutrients for plant growth. 
Um, it keeps the trees healthy because it keeps their, their roots covered. Um, and in turn, you have a nice um, abundance of native plants. Where on the right-hand side, when you get these, um, especially heavily infested areas, forests, with all different functional groups of earthworms. So from the deep dwellers up to the litter dwellers, um, you see they, have, they do a really good uh, job of mixing soil. So you lose those soil horizons. Um, you often get compacted soil, uh, it, um, a significant loss of organic matter, sometimes just down to the mineral soil, um, which exposes um, tree roots. You have very, very few native plants that um, can do well in that kind of harsh environment without that, that organic layer. Um, and some of the recent research has shown that there's a feedback loop where when you have earthworms come in, um, they really fundamentally change the soil ecosystem in such a way that they make it more readily available for other non-native and invasive plants such as buckthorn um, and garlic mustard. Um, and so they can, they're, they're called ecological engineers for a reason. They can really manipulate their environment um, and, and change that ecosystem. <clears throat> um, and it's in, term, in forests, it's often um, a negative consequence. So um, there's lots of ways that earthworms modify their environment. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all these, but um, just um, they can modify through physical means, chemical, biological ways, through just through their activities of, of, of burrowing, feeding, um, casting. So casting is the earthworm excrement. Um, it's basically when they feed on organic matter, um, they, they cast off basically little, what looks like little chunks of soil. Um, and those are high in nutrients. Um, but they, you know, they, they mix the soil profile, they add nutrients, they change nutrient dynamics, um, and they can potentially affect other um, organisms, um, whether they're microorganisms, macroorganisms, uh, ground nesting birds, all sorts of uh, interactions. Um, and so that's, that's what we know, especially about, about European earthworms and what they've done to um, areas, um, area, forested areas in the upper Midwest, New England area. Um, but now we have this, this second invasion of earthworms and these are a completely different organism. Um, these are amenthus uh, primarily, that's the name of the genus. There are other um, genera of, of um, jumping worms. Um, but primarily the ones that we have are, are in the Amenthus group. They are native to parts of Asia. Um, the ones that we have are primarily from Japan. Um, and interestingly, where they're endemic to um, Japan and the, and the Korean Peninsula, I guess, um, they're found in grasslands there. And we don't know, you know, we don't find them in, in grasslands or prairies very often in the States. Um, we don't know why that is exactly, um, and so there's a lot, a lot more to know about um, their their habitat preferences in 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 North America. Um, there are hundreds of species in this group, um, and so we have I think around 17 or 18 um, recorded species in in North America. Um, the Midwest, we probably have six or seven. I know in Wisconsin we have. Um, I think four or five different species confirmed. They, for the most part, they look similar um, and their behaviors are somewhat similar. Uh, in Wisconsin, the first record at the Arboretum uh, was in 2013. That was the first state record. Um, I don't know the first record in, in Michigan. It was probably earlier that, than that. Um, but like all of this species, um, the first record does not mean, usually mean the first time it was ever there. Um, there's always some lag effect when, invas when invasions happen that we don't pick up on uh, right away. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have a, um, a state statute called the Wisconsin Natural Resource Rule 40 that, um, that 
basically says that invasive species will be um, listed as either restricted or prohibited. Um, and it's, it's the, the, our Department of Natural Resources is charged with implementation of that um, statute. And so jumping worms in Wisconsin are not, are listed as restricted. Um, 10 years ago, they were prohibited until we found them and realized that they were spread far and wide. And so um, without any real um, silver bullet controls, we had to downgrade them to restricted. Um, which is a similar rating as like garlic mustard and buckthorn and honeysuckle that are spread far and wide. Um, but we still don't want people selling them or um, purposefully moving them around the landscape. Um, so there are co three really common species that we're finding that tend to co-occur together. Um, and I'll just mention them. It's a bit academic because they look really similar. Um, but their names are Amenthus tokioensis, Amenthus agrestis, and Metaphyr hilgendorfi. So this is a different genus. They're all jumping worms, they all have similar behavior. The real difference is their size. Um, Amenthus tokioensis tends to be on the smaller size between three and five inches. Um, and the Metaphyr hilgendorfi can be eight, nine inches long. So a, a quite a big earthworm. But all three you're gonna find uh, together potentially in the same area, they're epiendogeic and they're all parthenogenic. So um, they all behave pretty similarly. Okay, so um, one of the really important things um, for anyone working in natural areas and gardens and are concerned about um, you know, doing what you can to not spread um, jumping worms around the landscape in, inadvertently is to understand what to look for. Um, and so I'm going to put up some comparison traits under each of these photos. So we have, have a typical Amenthus species jumping worm on the left hand side, and then a pretty common European earthworm called Lumbricus rubellus. Um, the reason why I'm comparing jumping worms to this uh, Lumbricus species is that they're both epiendogeic, and so you potentially could find them in the same area. Um, and so it's just good to know the differences. Um, so the first one, which I, I put up here, and then I always say right away that it's not a very good trait to, to lean on. Um, the size of things in nature can be uh, very dependent on environmental conditions, on genetics, and all sorts of things, all sorts of variables. And so um, it's, it's, very, it's a very relative trait <clears throat> sometimes. In general, though, jumping worms uh, will be larger than a lot of the European species that you're going to find, um, with the exception of the common nightcrawler. Um, but again, those are the deep burrowing ones, so you may not see them um, in the same soil profile area. Um, so just, you know, this is one just to kind of keep in the back of, of your mind, but um, again, not, a, not necessarily a great trait to, to hang your hat on. Um, the life cycles are very different. So this is one of the main differences between jumping worms, uh, the ones that we have in North America and European worms, is that jumping worms have an annual life cycle. So um, in a couple of weeks here, um, once we get a string of warm days together, we're gonna start, they're gonna start to hatch from their cocoons. Um, and then after a period of 70 or 80 days, they will become reproductively mature and they'll start, to, they'll start to produce their own cocoons. Um, and um, they'll, they'll often have two generations of adults. Um, so, you know, around mid-June, early July, the earthworms, these jumping worms will be mature. They'll create their own cocoons. And then at the end of the season, those will be mature and they'll also start creating cocoons. So the end of the season is when we see the highest abundance of jumping worms. And end of season is September, um, sometime early October. By the end of October though, after the first hard freeze, they all go away. Um, they do not overwinter as adults. Um, their cocoons are able to survive our winter temperatures. And then that's the next generation the following year. Whereas European species, while they also produce cocoons, they have the ability to burrow below the frost line and they can 
over winter as adults. And so that's why um, if you're seeing large earthworms now, um, they are most certainly not jumping worms unless you have um, some odd sort of local microclimate that keeps, that is, keeps the soil artificially warm all winter. Um, not until, you know, probably the earliest would be end of May where you start to see adult jumping worms and more likely June. So if you see worms now, I, I get this question every year. I'm seeing a lot of earthworms or the jumping worms. Um, the answer is almost always no. Um, and then their, their skin um, texture and color tends to be different. Um, jumping worms are, are more of a brown, which I think you can probably pick up from these slides. Um, darker dorsally, so on their back. Um, and, then, and, um, and then lighter on their belly, ventrally. Um, and so, and they're also much more rigid than European earthworms um, that tend to be reddish brown in color. And as you know, kind of, kind of wiggly, um, but jumping worms are, are quite rigid, which allows them to um, have this jumping behavior that we'll talk about here more in a moment. Another great identifier when, the, when, jumping, when earthworms are adults is that um, jumping worms have a milky white clitellum. So all earthworms have uh, a clitellum, which is kind of the reproductive center of, their, of the earthworm where they produce, produce uh, cocoons. Um, on the jumping worm, as you can see from this red arrow, um, it's often milky white, um, sometimes a light pink, but usually a whiter color. Uh, it's annular, meaning that it's a, it's a full ring. It goes all the way around the body and it's smooth to the body. So it's not raised at all. Whereas Lumbricus rubellus and all other European earthworms have a raised clitellum. Um, and you can kind of tell that from this photo, the red arrow pointing to the clitellum again, I'll put my cursor there. It's slightly raised. It's roughly the same color as the rest of the body, kind of a pinkish red, um, but it's a, it's a saddle shape. So if you flip the earthworm over, you'll see that the clitellum, the ends do not meet. There's a space between them. Um, and that's always the case for no matter what species of European earthworms um, you might have in your yard or where you're, where you're working. So that's a very good indication that you might, that you have jumping worms if it's, a uh, full ring and it's smooth and it's this off white color. Um, <clears throat> now, if you wanna really get nerdy and you have a microscope and you wanna collect earthworms, you can actually count the number of segments um, from the nose, which is quote unquote nose, the tip here back to the first ring or the first segment of the cotellum and the cotellum uh, is situated on segments 14 to 16, whereas the cotellum on European earthworms is farther back, 26 to 32. Again, that doesn't matter. The, the, the number of segments doesn't matter, but you can tell from the photos that the cotellum is much closer to the head of the earthworm on jumping worms and farther back on European earthworms. Just another trait to use. And if you know about jumping worms, you know about their behavior, Jumping worms can be very active. Um, they can, you know, they don't have legs, so they're not physically jumping, but they will flop around. Um, they will move like a snake to get away from you. Whereas other earthworms are not that active. They might be wiggly, um, but they're not, they're not flopping around and not trying to snake away from you actively. Um, so another really good way to tell if you have or have had a jumping worms is to look at the soil. Um, and you can do that now in your yard. Um, and um, jumping worms create a very distinct casting layer. It looks a lot like coffee grounds. I've also heard it described as taco meat, but I like tacos and I don't want to associate that with casting, so I don't use that one. Um, but they create a very ubiquitous, uh, porous, loose soil. Whereas other earthworms um, kind of create these dispersed casts 
um, piles of casts of different shapes and sizes. Um, and so they're very distinct, they're very distinctly different, I should say. Um, and you can do that, you know, you can tell in the winter, those casts, as far as we know, unless they are eroded away, they don't uh, turn back into soil. <clears throat> and then finally, another behavior, um, jumping worms have the ability to drop um, the end set their tail when they're handled roughly. Other earthworms, uh, as far as I know, won't do that. Um, we don't know why that happens. It's probably some defense mechanism. Um, and it's also very creepy, which is adds to their lore. So I'm gonna show some video. Oh, actually, I'm gonna show yep, one more photo here. Here's a good example of the casting layer I was mentioning, the coffee ground layer. So this is a single photo from the Arboretum several years ago now of an invasion front. So on the left, we have soil with jumping worms. They've been there for a while working the soil. On the right, um, we have soil that have European species, but no jumping worms yet. Um, and that, I hope it comes through okay on the slide, but you can kind of tell, uh, for one, there's less leaf matter, less organic matter, and pretty granular, dark granular soil here. Whereas over here, it looks more like typical soil. It's more together. You can kind of see little, little castings here and there, which is probably from Lumbricus rubellus. Um, but it's a very different looking soil. And this is without seeing any earthworms at all. Um, it, just, it just appears to be different. All right, so I'm gonna show a couple of videos here. Um, Cause it's really the best way to describe jumping worms. Oops, I'm gonna go back. So full disclosure, we actually collected worms and put them in this pile just for dramatic, dramatic effect. So that's what, that's what they do in a, in a mass. Here's a good example of their snaking behavior. And if you can, you can see, you can see this is the head. This is their, that white quetellum. This is the tail. I'll show that one again. Okay. Um, and then here's an example of um, a jumping worm that drops its tail after being handled roughly by myself. You can kind of see the end here starting to wiggle out on its own. <clears throat> There it goes. So what's happened there is it's only just dropped the last 15 or so segments. Um, the earthworm is still alive. Um, it can still re reproduce. Again, the, the, the uh, cotelum is up here. Um, it may, you know, it may not live as long. Uh, we don't know. Um, but what, 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 what hasn't happened is that um, two earthworms haven't been created. This is just a tail fragment that will that serves no purpose now, um, and so the earthworm though is still reproductively mature. In theory, it can still produce produce cocoons, um, but it may be a little bit. Um, its fitness may be declining a little bit. It may not be quite as healthy. So um, we don't have this earthworm. <laughs> uh, this you know things could be worse here, folks. This is. Um, from what I understand, this is the largest earthworm on the planet. It's the giant Gippsland earthworm from Australia. It can get up to 10 to 12 feet long. It's native to Australia. Um, it's really disturbing. And I can't imagine finding this in my garden at home. Um, but again, so things could be worse. You know, we have a 10 inch, 10 inch earthworm, but we don't have a 10 foot earthworm. So that's, that's something. All right. Um, so again, this is a little bit academic as well, but I mentioned that we have three earthworm species and they're listed here on the bottom of this photo. Um, and they range in size from the, the larger metafires to the smaller tokyoenses. And correspondingly, um, their body size dictates the size of their castings. And so you can see the tokyoensis castings are quite small compared to the larger metafire castings. Um, and so just know that if you do see, if you have an infestation, you see a lot of different size castings, but they're still kind of in that flat, um, you know, porous state, you might just have more than one species. Um, 
and you know that 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 can happen because they they do there are a couple of species that are fond together. Um, I mentioned that for jumping worms, it's vital for their population that they produce cocoons because that's what overwinters. These are four Amenthus tokyoensis cocoons um, with a penny for scale. They are very small, obviously. They're about two millimeters across. They're brown, just like soil. Um, they're slightly um, uh, oblong. Um, they have a little point on one end. That's where the cocoon has, has finished forming and come together. Um, so you can see, given how small they are, what they look like, they're really easy to miss. It took us, it took us quite a while to figure out how to find them in the soil. Um, and we have a process of wet sieving soil. Um, and um, it's, it's a kind of a lengthy process to isolate earth, to isolate the cocoons, uh, which we want to do to learn more about them and how to basically how to kill them. Um, so there, this is the, the, the part of the life cycle that we're working on now because they're, this is how they're spread probably um, because they're so cryptic. Um, you know, you can see the earthworms, um, but these cocoons can easily glom onto soil particles, which can go onto your boots or onto a shovel or onto a car tire. Um, and if you go, you know, somewhere else to work or whatnot, there you go. You've potentially infested a new area. Um, and this is a baby jumping worm. Um, they are about 10 millimeters long. Um, usually one cocoon produces one earthworm. Um, we have found twins before, but that's pretty rare. Um, and one of the things to note here is that um, they, when they are born, um, they are born pigmented, just like this. There are, there, are, there, are, there are worms called potworms that some of you might be familiar with. Um, they are really common, they're everywhere. They're not actually earthworms but they um, are about this size and um, they are very active as well. They have this ability to just kind of like wave their, their body around. Um, and we thought when we first were working with these earthworms that we were seeing tons of new hatchlings of uh, jumping worms, um, but they pot worms are not pigmented. And so once we started to actually hatch these in, in the lab, we noticed these are all already pigmented. And so um, we know that those, those pot worms are, are not jumping worms and they're actually not harmful at all. Um, so, but it makes it hard to see jumping worms when they're first hatched because they blend in with the soil and the leaves really easily. So usually it takes um, several weeks or months to actually start to see them when they're, when they're adults. So why are we concerned about um, jumping worms besides the fact that they're kind of creepy? Well, they represent for native habitats, especially a triple whammy, um, which includes you know, this first wave of European earthworms um, and then throw in a high abundance of deer. And now this other really different type of earthworm called jumping worms um, and it's, it's a hard go for native plants and animals um, with this kind of um, uh, predator pressure and disturbance. Um, we know that um, you know, earthworms in general, including jumping worms, chew through litter layer in deciduous forests. Um, they cr create inhospitable environments for native plants. They tend to, um, uh, kind of lead the edge for exotic species to, to move into. They really change soil dynamics. Um, so all these things are true um, for any type of earthworm. Now you might be thinking, okay, this might be true for forests, but I thought earthworms were good for my garden. And I know a lot of folks listening are probably um, active gardeners, you know, native gardening with native plants. Um, and so, you know, we've been told forever that, you know, earthworms are part of a healthy, um, healthy garden soil. So isn't that true? And like many things in nature, the answer is yes and no. Um, especially with urban, urban gardens, um, large scale agriculture, 
they often have compacted soil um, that does need amendment, right? Whether it's some kind of fertilizer or, um, you know, aeration. Um, and, you know, especially deep dwelling earthworms like the common nightcrawler, those anisic species, um, do a great job of creating tunnels, um, which allow um, air, water to infiltrate to the root zone. Um, they eat a lot of organic matter, um, which they in turn um, uh, move around the soil. They move to, to the root zones. They're high in plant nutrients like phosphorus and calcium, nitrogen, magnesium. Um, so they're producing all these, they're eating organic matter, producing these nutrient rich castings, um, but then moving them all around. So they're getting to where they need to be, which is not the case with um, jumping worms that I'll, I'll explain here in a, in a moment. Um, so on the jumping worm front, jumping worms like we know now, they are only hanging out really in the top litter layer, maybe the top few centimeters of soil. So they're not effective at all at aerating the soil. They're not, move, they're not moving anything around. They're not mixing the soil up. Um, they can even create too much pore space because they're drying out the soil. So think about they're, they're working and reworking and reworking, churning that organic matter, but only in the top few inches of soil. Um, that's why the casting layer is so, um, uh, it, it forms large flat casting areas, very poor, porous soil. Um, and that soil becomes very loose and it's highly, it's highly erodible, um, especially if you're working on any sort of slope areas. Um, you know, and we, get, we get a heavy rain event and potentially all that um, nutrient risk rich castings are all of a sudden lost from um, the site. Um, soil can be too loose for plants to establish. We have, that, we have that issue at the Arboretum in our native plant garden where some of the areas are highly infested with jumping worms and we simply can't plant um, plants into that soil. The roots just won't take, there's nothing to hold the roots. Um, and so a good way to think about this is um, which you might be asking yourself is, well, you know, earthworms of all types, including jumping worms, eat organic matter. They create nutrient-rich castings. So that's what they do. That's why earthworms can be beneficial for, you know, vermicomposting and for a garden. But again, jumping worms um, are only working in one area of the soil. And because they're annual species, it takes them a while to ramp up their populations throughout the growing season. And so I mentioned earlier, when they're at their highest abundance in late August, September, that's when they're really able to produce nutrients in, in their castings. But the problem is that that is, that's, that is an offset with when the plants actually need that nutrients, right? So plants are looking pretty soon here to get nutrients into their roots, water nutrients that they can uh, put energy into above ground biomass, produce um, leaves and flowers and seeds, etc. But with jumping worms are removing those nutrients from the soil um, later in the year and, and not allowing the plants to take up some of that nutrients. And then those nutrients, it's kind of like a quick release fertilizer. The nutrients are, are um, produced late in the year when the plants don't need the nutrients. Um, when they're working to put carbohydrates back into their roots over winter. And then again, um, we have, if we get heavy rains, all that nutrients can be washed away and um, lost from the soil. Um, and, you know, this can happen in a variety of different habitats. Uh, we've seen it even in turf grass where a high bunch of, a bunch of jumping worms, they will actually feed on the really um, small skinny roots that turf grass has and some new seedlings have, they will actually feed on them. Um, they're, they're, I mentioned that as well. So they're a very different organism from other earthworms and behave quite differently. Um, so, um, you know, where, how are they moving around the landscape? Um, and like many invasive species, um, humans are, are at least one part of the story um, through our um, landscaping, gardening, 
um, horticultural practices, a lot of the material that we use is great food and habitat for jumping worms. So compost piles, wood mulch, um, soil, um, leaves, all organic matter like that, prime habitat for jumping worms. Um, and if you think about, if you live in an urban area, um, like Kalamazoo, like Madison, um, you know, often municipalities will have um, leaf pickup or, um, you know, yard waste pickup. And sometimes that, that material goes to a central depository where it's composted or whatnot. And then it's either used um, for municipal projects or it's sold or provided to, for the community to come and pick up. Um, and then it's spread far and wide. And that material could very easily have um, jumping worms, uh, the actual earthworms, or more likely the cocoons. Uh, because remember, that's, they like to be in that type of environment. Um, and and uh, plant sales, another um, very popular, very important um, community event for, I'm sure, your wild one group, um, master gardening groups. Um, our arboretum has an annual plant sale. And so this was a really, a really big deal and still is. Um, how do we hold plant sales, but also be, be cognizant and be cautious about not spreading jumping worms um, unknowingly? And um, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. But um, again, we have to be careful because this is a prime way of inadvertently spreading um, jumping worms around the landscape. <clears throat> Um, so places like nurseries, you know, greenhouses, anywhere that um, deals with this kind of material could potentially be harboring um, jumping worms. And we worked in Wisconsin, at least, we worked closely with um, the state and with the green industry. Um, and the private sector have been really good partners in helping to do what we can to slow the spread because it's in their best interest not to have jumping worms because um, the word is out. People are asking questions about them. Um, and they don't want to be selling um, infested material either. Um, and then um, our practices, right? So the tools we use, uh, the machinery that we use, make sure that we are cleaning our material before we um, arrive at a new garden or natural area and before we leave. Just, and this goes for any kind of invasive species. Um, and then um, fishing bait. Um, we know that earthworms are used for fishing bait, night crawlers, for example. Um, in Wisconsin, at least, it's illegal to sell jumping worms for fishing bait. Um, of course, in the age of the internet, it's actually really easy to get jumping worms by mail. Um, but we want to avoid um, using earthworms, um, or at least um, the real the real point here is not to dispose of them. The um, the earthworms that are left after fishing that you, that we don't use not to throw them in the lake or in the woods, uh, dispose of them properly. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these slides. and just mention that we did a, um, a survey of the Madison metro area looking for jumping worms and different habitat types. Um, and what we found wasn't real surprising, but um, we were able to quantify it in an urban area, which is where we're finding a lot of these jumping worms. Um, they were found in, um, residential gardens. So we went to people's backyards and surveyed. Um, they're, they're found in adjacent turf grass lawns. They're found in forests, uh, but we did not find any in prairies. Um, and there was a high correlation between um, jumping worms that were found in gardens that were treated with wood mulch. Um, in fact, there were only out of 90 or so gardens, there was only a handful that um, had jumping worms and had not been treated with wood mulch. Um, and then this survey is how we discovered a new, this new metafire species um, in, in Madison. It was the first record in, in Wisconsin. All right, so um, you're probably wondering now, all this information is great. What, what can we do about, about this? And um, like, like many things, the science lags um, in, in terms of um, what people want to know, right? It takes time to figure out um, 
ways to control um, invasive species and best management practices and, and whatnot. But um, we do have a list of what are called best management practices, BMSP, BMPs, that um, everyone, everyone can use. Um, and so I'm gonna run through these kind of quickly. Um, this is actually on the Wisconsin DNR website. Um, and I don't know if the Michigan, the, um, uh, the, the Michigan DNR or your similar organization has um, a jumping worm website or not, but um, the first thing to do, which is really simple, is just watch for jumping worms. Just be aware of signs of their presence. And, you know, now, um, listening through this presentation and reading up on jumping worms. Um, you know, I find that um, audiences like yourself are, 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 are already doing this, right? Like you're already in tune with, with nature, with your garden, the areas that you work. And so you're gonna notice changes. You're, you're gonna notice jumping worms um, once you know what, what to look for. Um, so educating yourself and others to recognize what to look for. And again, uh, hopefully this presentation will be helpful in that, um, but sharing your knowledge with your neighbors. Um, that's, that's a really um, somewhat obvious step, but um, doesn't always happen. And that can really, really be, be useful. Um, only you sell, plant, purchase, or trade landscape and garden materials and plants that appear to be free of jumping worms. Um, that sounds great, but not super easy to do. Um, how do you know if, if you buy a bag of mulch and it doesn't and it has jumping worms? I mean, you don't always know that, especially if it has cocoons and all those kind of things. So, what we're getting at here is um, do what you can. Ask questions about, um, you know, if you go to a greenhouse and there's a pile of compost, and um, you know, asking questions like, do you have jumping worms? Do you know about about them? Is this compost free of jumping worms? Um, if you buy a potted plant, look at the soil. Does it look really granular? Um, you might not want to buy that one. Buy something that is, is less granular or is in a soilless medium. Um, and then when we talk about compost, so in Wisconsin, I don't know about Michigan, um, but actually many states have really similar statutes for commercial compost production. Um, compost um, in Wisconsin, at least, and I think I actually think Michigan too. Um, commercial composters have to heat their compost piles to, I believe, it's 131 degrees Fahrenheit for um, a certain number of days, depending on the type of pile um, that, that they're using, and that is to kill um, pathogens and um, harmful fungi. Um, it also kills earthworms of all types, including jumping worms. And we know that um, through, through research that we've done at the Arboretum, that at 104 degrees Fahrenheit, so quite a bit less than what compost piles should be heated at for three days, that um, all cocoons of jumping worms are, are rendered non-viable. Um, and so if, if you're buying commercially produced compost um, and it's, and uh, at least in, in Wisconsin again, and um, I would think Michigan too has a similar statute, then you can be relatively sure that you're buying compost that is, has been through a heated process and you know, should be okay. Do you ever know? No. Um, you know, what, we don't, what we can't control for always is what happens to that compost once it's heated. Is, it, is the, the bobcat that picks it up and moves it to somewhere else, is that bobcat clean? Et cetera, et cetera. So, but these are just ways that we can try to minimize our exposure, uh, minimize moving them around. And I mentioned this already. This is a really easy one, but often overlooked. Arrive clean, leave clean. Clean soil and soil debris from your vehicle tires, from equipment, personal gear before moving around the landscape. Um, and that goes for all kinds of invasive species. Um, there's a really fun way to test your yard or where you work for earthworms of, of any sort. Um, and researchers use this sampling. It's, it's, it's a mustard solution sampling. Um, we use this to look at um, the number of earthworms that we have in a, in a unit. 
Um, and if you have a really new infestation of jumping worms, you could even use this as a control technique. Um, what do you do is you mix a third cup of dry mustard powder with a gallon of water. Um, and it's any kind of dry mustard. It doesn't have to be fancy Dijon mustard. It's just yellow mustard. I buy it by the 10 pound box from a restaurant wholesaler. Um, you mix it up really well. Um, go to your area that you wanna look at, remove what you can of, of the leaves um, so that you have a good soil contact. You pour roughly half of the solution over. Um, I have a square foot of soil here. You can, you can actually do more than that, especially for jumping worms since you're gonna be right at the top. You don't need a whole lot of the solution. Um, but pour some of it over an area, wait a few minutes, then pour the other half. And um, any earthworm that is in that soil column that the mustard reaches will come to the surface. Um, and what's happening is that um, the earthworms breathe through their skin. They have very poor skin, porous skin. And the earthworm <clears throat> or the, the mustard solution acts as a skin irritant. And their response is to burrow out of the soil, come to the top. And so you can literally just pick them out of the soil. Um, and in the case of jumping worms, they're right at the surface. And so here's a video showing this technique. <clears throat> and see, see if you can spot the jumping worms as they come out. So we cleared away the soil. Now we're pouring the solution on top. There we go. See the clitellum there? So they come, they, they're, they're right there. So they will come quickly if you have them. Okay, so um, I mentioned that there's research that um, we've done at the Arboretum that show the cocoons cannot survive 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so that's in terms of control, heat is an option. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. Um, and heat, um, use in commercial composting is a great way uh, for that heat to be applied, especially at, at higher temperatures um, for at least three days. And we know that fire um, itself through, you know, whether it's prescribed burning in oak savanna, um, um, you know, reducing your uh, burning, burning brush, for example, um, will reduce the viability of jumping worm cocoons. <clears throat> so that's that's good. Um, the, the issue there is how do we apply this on our own property? And we'll talk about that here in a, in a little bit. Um, besides heat, um, there are some chemical applications that we can use. Um, a lot of these things have not been uh, researched. Uh, one that has though recently is this um, product called Botanigard which is pretty widely available, I believe, in most garden shops, uh, hardware stores. It's, it's, it's a commercial um, entometh entomopathogenic fungal um, isolate. And, and so what that means basically is that it, it affects a lot of um, soft bodied organisms. So it's not just jumping worms that might be affected, um, but it's, it's this fungus called Bouveria bassiana, um, which is a naturally occurring fungus in the soil. Um, and so this group, um, Norian and Gores, looked at um, the fungus alone, so they isolated the actual fungus, and compared that to the commercial, um, the per label use of the Tenegard, and found fairly similar results. The fungus itself was a little better in terms of mortality of earthworms. You can see it killed earthworms up to 70% in four weeks. Whereas the Botanigar that you buy off the shelf and use per label um, had about a 60% mortality in, in four weeks. What's nice about this product is that it's already commercially available and it's, um, it's already, it is, it is you'd be using it um, on label use. So it's, it wouldn't be an off label use to, to, use or to use on earthworms, which isn't the case with some other products. Um, one of these products is early bird fertilizer, which some of you may have heard about. <clears throat> um, I think they actually have a, 
distribution center in Ann Arbor, where I've purchased some in the past. Um, they no longer produce this product, but um, there's a couple other products like it out there. It's an organic fertilizer um, with um, saponins from a, a, a species of Chinese tree called the, the tea seed tree, um, tea seed oil. Um, and that's mixed together. And so it's a really low um, nitrogen fertilizer um, that's often used by golf course managers to not only use the fertilizer on the golf course, but also the saponins will kill earthworms, which golf course managers do not like because they make the soil um, uneven. Um, it does, it's very effective. We've used it here at the Arboretum. It's very effective when coming into contact with earthworms. It does not appear to be effective at all on cocoons. Um, and again, it's also an off-label use. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so I don't recommend using it, um, even though it, it does has shown that it, it can work. Um, and we don't know a lot about its effect on other soil biota, the off the residual effect. Um, there's only been one study that has looked at um, the effect on other organisms and it had kind of mixed results. Um, people have been using things like uh, Castile soap mixed with water, uh, vinegar mixed with water. Um, again, these all seem to be very effective on jumping worms, but they have other impacts, potentially uh, negative impacts on some plants. Um, mixing vinegar into your soil will likely change the pH. Um, and so there's all these other impacts that just you, we need to be aware of when we're, when we're trying to control for one organism. Um, it doesn't mean that other things might be affected that uh, we might care about. Um, a physical control um, is potentially biochar. Um, and it's, it, the, it's, it depends a lot on the type of biochar. Um, it does seem to work to reduce numbers of European earthworms, um, but there's no published re uh, research that I've seen that has used it with jumping worms. Um, but I think there's going to be some folks that are going to be looking at that soon, hopefully. So um, coming to the end here, there are some things that we can try in our, in our garden, whether we're using native plants primarily or um, ornamentals or, or what have you. And so, so we know that earthworms, um, they, they, they like wood mulch. That's, that's food for them. And so one of the things that we can try is you know, reducing the amount that we use on an annual basis. And this is tricky, right? Because um, mulch is a really important component of our garden. It retains moisture, um, it reduces weeds, um, but it's also a buffet for jumping worms. And so there, you know, if that, if this may not be something that is, is possible in your situation. You just have to have the wood mulch and you're willing to deal with the jumping worms and that's fine, but it's just good to know that um, you know, the mulch is also their, their food source. So what we can do is think about one, if we don't have jumping worms already and we don't want them, making sure that we're getting mulch from a re reputable source. If you've been getting it from somewhere all along, whether you're buying it from a big box store or your neighbors or wherever, and you don't have jumping worms yet, then by all means, continue to use that source. Um, you know, local in this case is probably better um, then going to a big box store and buying malt from, you know, wherever, um, knowing where you're getting it from um, seems to be a, a really good idea to me um, that you can ask some questions about how it was made, etc. cetera. Um, experiment with other types of malt. Um, coconut malt is one that I know people have tried. Um, this um, can be a good option. I, my understanding though is it, it can be toxic to, to pets. So keep that in mind. I don't know much about coconut mulch. Um, many of you probably do. Um, use things like pine needles, hay, uh, native grass mulch. These organic sources are potentially less palatable to earthworms um, and jumping worms in, in particular. Um, they much prefer organic sources like maple leaves and to a lesser extent, oak leaves. Um, and then experiment with, with, with heat. So we've talked about heat being uh, a good option. 
Um, but that can be really tricky to use in your urban yard, right? Um, so people I know are trying different ways of solarizing their soil through using um, clear plastic, kind of creating a greenhouse effect. Um, and I think this has some promise if you have the right situation, if you have um, an open south facing yard, for example, it could be really a good idea to try this. Um, trying it now, even earlier than now um, for next year, um, before the, when the plants are still dormant. Um, and if you're able to heat up that soil, the top, even a few centimeters of soil where those, those cocoons are to 104 degrees for a few days, um, you might be able to reduce the population quite a bit. Um, you know, things like steam, um, some people are trying with a handheld propane torch, similar to how you might treat garlic mustard in, in a infested woods. Um, again, like if it's at any sort of scale, these become trickier, right? So um, if your infestation is really large, you know, torching your entire backyard eh, may not be um, amenable really, or may, may, not be, may not be the way to go, let's say. Um, but if you have an isolated infestation, you know, running a torch over that soil, um, and it wouldn't need to be, you know, a three days of continuous fire by any means, obviously, you know, that's much hotter than 104 degrees. Uh, it'd probably be an instantaneous um, burning up those cocoons. Um, so I want to take some, I know I'm already probably over time here, but I want to at least have a question. There are some resources here. Wisconsin DNR has really good information on dumping worms. Um, the Arboretum has information. If you're interested in earthworm generally, especially um, learning more about that mustard pour, they had the recipe at the Great Lakes Worm Watch, which is out of um, the University of Minnesota Duluth. And just an FYI for the future, and it's possible some of you um, were in this study. Um, we, I, I have a, a grant right now to look at, um, to learn basically from gardeners about what they're seeing in, in their yard, what plants are being affected with the idea of, of creating a list of plants and plant families that may or may not be affected by jumping worms that we can use not only as an out outreach tool, <clears throat> um, but also to use for more research about um, what plant traits might um, confer some resilience to plants from jumping worm impacts. Um, and there might be plants that just don't care and are just fine being in soil that's disturbed by jumping worms, but it'd be good, it'd be good to, to know that. Um, and so uh, we hope to have material out this summer or this fall on our findings. So with that, um, I am happy to take any questions. All right, so Brad, you did a, a really good job of answering a lot of the questions that were submitted. Um, one, one question uh, is, what are the natural predators of earthworms besides robins and maybe other other birds are, are there other natural uh predators yep yeah for sure so um some amphibians um and and herptiles will, will eat them um so we know that um toads will eat them garter snakes will eat them and this is for any any earthworms um but we also know recently there's a, a, a student at madison that looked at toads and and garter snakes in, in particular um, garter snakes did consume dumping worms. Um, toads tried to, but they gave up because their behavior was probably too much of uh, too much energy for them, but they would attack them, but then wouldn't eat them. So some do, some don't. Birds will eat them. Some mammals will eat them for sure. Um, you know, raccoons, possums will eat, eat earthworms. Um, the question of course is, is there enough of that predator pressure to diminish the population and unlikely that would be the case, but um, right. who knows? Okay, great. Um, I, I think you answered, you know, of course, how to get rid of jumping worms if found on our, on, uh, on your property. Um, someone had asked, Andrea had asked if, if uh, straw mulch was okay, which you answered. Um, how did they, how did these worms originally get here from Asia? That was one of the questions. Uh, yeah, that's a good from one. Barbara. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so we don't really know, um, but we think they've actually been in um, the lower 48 states for about 100 years. So they've been here a long time, which is really interesting, at least a couple of species. Um, places like Georgia, um, South Carolina, Tennessee. Um, and we think they came over with the, with the international plant trade, um, you know, moving plants around. They, they could be in the soil, in a root ball of a woody shrub. Um, that could be how we got them at the Arboretum. We have a 30 acre um, woody plant collection of species from all over the world. Um, and there's just no telling, you know, how, which plant might have had dumping worms or which soil had them. Um, so we don't, we, as far as we know, they weren't purposely brought here, you know, like the gypsy moth was for any sort of, um, you know, product. Um, they were just sort of hitchhikers probably in the yeah. plant, plant trade. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, last question. Uh... Marty is asking, would freezing them in the freezer kill them? Um, freezing the earthworms themselves for sure would kill them. Yeah. Uh, freezing the cocoons, probably not, although it depends, it, de it depends how, how cold uh, the freezer is. You know, they, we know that, um, well, I should take that back actually. So we know that, you know, they can survive um, southern Wisconsin, southern Michigan temperatures, um, but that's with a layer, usually with a layer of snow, um, and within the upper layers of soil and maybe some organic. So there is probably some temperature buffering going on there. Um, but still, you know, it gets it can get down to zero degrees, obviously below below freezing every year in, in our areas. Um, so at, at some, there probably is some threshold that they can't survive, um, and what actually will probably affect them more than the cold is just the, the, the drying effect of, of the cold, um, the, the desiccation. Uh, we've seen that they will, when they dry, the cocoons tend to kind of pimple. And so they, they lose that moisture. Um, they can bounce back from that, but they're usually not, they don't usually have a viable offspring. So it depends how cold, I guess. Okay. Uh, and speaking of cocoons, this is the last question. Um, with purchasing earthworm castings, is there a possibility that those castings might contain jumping worm uh, cocoons? Yes. Yeah. For, I mean, there it definitely contains earthworm cocoons. I would be right. hard not to. And um, yeah, if I would, that, that's that's a product that I'd be very cautious of purchasing. Um, you know, knowing where if you can find out if you're buying earthworm cast castings for your garden in particular, knowing exactly where it came from and what earthworms were used. Um, Cause that would be a perfect recipe for cocoons to be, jumping worm cocoons to be involved. Great. Well, Brad, thank you uh, very much. I, I know I learned a lot. I'll never look at a, an earthworm uh, the same again. <laughs> and <laughs> good. You're right. And judging by the uh, number of questions, uh, everyone was uh, uh, very, uh, I think, enthusiastic and, and uh, kind of in tune with, with what you were speaking about. So Great. thanks for, for joining us tonight and, and uh, give us, giving us your expertise. So I appreciate uh, you being here. Yeah, you both. Um, and, and Jason, just so you, if anyone wants to follow up with me, um, feel free to share my email and I can follow up with that too if, if, if you'd like. So. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. One one last message before we let everyone go, and, and we appreciate everyone for, for sticking around. Uh, just a, a plug for our biggest fundraiser of the year, which is our community native plant sale, uh, which is June 18th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the People's Food Co-op in Kalamazoo. Um, everyone is welcome. You don't need to be a member to participate, so we hope to see you there. Again, thanks everyone for joining tonight and uh, we'll see you soon. Have a good evening.